client-side uh, vulnerabilities, something which um, not many people do. Um, so um, I'm looking forward to the talk. Thanks, guys. So, let's see, can get it going here. Just click on it. All right. So, uh, that's us. We're both co founders of uh, Full Scope Security. Uh, I've got a blog, carnalonage.blogspot. I kind of co blog with uh, Dean DeBeer. So, if you're around for uh, Dan's talk, uh, Dean's my other co blogger. Uh, brand new member of the Metasploit project, uh, focusing a lot on some documentation and a whole bunch of Oracle uh, attacks, uh, which are forthcoming. And a uh, happy new proud member of Attack Research. So thanks, Val. And Vince, uh, he blogs and everything else. He's been around for a while. Uh, so from a presentation Zen point of view, we got four key points. I want to kind of get across when you leave here that attackers use client-side attacks. That's the new remote exploit. Uh, you need to allow your penetration testers to use those because it's replicating the threat that you, you have every day and we're doing that because we need to test our organization's ability to detect and respond to those attacks. Let's not pretend that they don't happen. Let's work on detecting and responding to those things. So my quick rant is, if you've told your penetration testing people are coming in that you can't use it because your users aren't trained, um, I won't say the word, but that's what you probably knew in your heart when you said that to them. And as, and as a pen test shop, that's probably what you knew as well. So with that out of the way, is that a proper security model? When we ignore problems, do they go away? Anybody? Interact with me a little bit, right? No, I usually go to the doctor if I have a problem. If we see something going on, ignoring it doesn't go, the attacker won't leave if we just leave him alone. Oh. <clears throat> so, that. All right, so like Chris said, uh, client sides are the new remote exploit. Um, once upon a time, remote exploitation was easy. It was all kinds of web servers that were easy to break into, that hadn't been patched, all kinds of services that were internet facing, web facing, nothing was filtered. So it was really easy to break into darn near anything. Uh, traffic going in and out of your network wasn't really monitored as well as it is today. <clears throat> so the new way to get in is from the client side, coming in, going out. Um, like we said, it's becoming very uh, critical to actually test your networks or your, your users' susceptibility to client side attacks, since that's really what the bad guys are using. And the reason that they'll continue to grow and we'll continue to see more of these types of attacks is because they work, because users aren't very well trained. <clears throat> so I don't want to bore everybody with uh, statistics, but as you can see here, uh, eight out of the top 20 categories from SANS show uh, incidents that are directly related to client side attacks. Um, and more researchers are looking for vulnerabilities in client sides because operating systems are getting harder to exploit themselves. <clears throat> Some more stats. Uh, last quarter of 08, um, it shows that eight of the top 10 web attack vectors all require some type of user interaction. So that's exactly what we're talking about, client side attacks. Uh, your browsers, uh, your you know, antivirus, anti-malware 2009, uh, malicious Web 2.0 components, all of your Adobe components that you're running, Adobe, um, Flash, PDF, uh, and even movies, QuickTime, like you saw in the last presentation, and real player vulnerabilities. <clears throat> um, so everybody in here probably has a Nigerian uncle that wants to give him a couple billion dollars if you respond to that email. <clears throat> well, every I'm sure, time. every time, yeah. Uh, I'm sure that we've all gotten that email or some other email similar to it. Uh, and I hope that all the people in this room, since you're in this room, didn't actually respond to it or click that link. Well, over the last two years, one in 13 households did click on that link or respond to that email. Uh, reasons where they didn't have an antivirus, anti-spyware, anti-phishing. Um, so what we propose is that if one in 13 people will open something as random as that, that if we direct a targeted attack against your organization based on open source intelligence, that one in 13 of your users are also gonna open that email. <clears throat> so I talked about the good old days when it was easy to remotely exploit everything, uh, and it's getting a lot harder. And some of the reasons are we actually have these dedicated security teams now. We have SOCs that are in place to monitor all of our daily security incidents. Uh, most organizations understand the differences between your internal network and your external network and what a DMZ really is and what it's supposed to be. 
Uh, we know how to actually dedicate items to servers and harden them properly. Uh, we use intrusion prevention and detection systems. And software security is improving in most vendors. So what's the weak link? <clears throat> so the result of all that is the new low-hanging fruit and client-side attacks. So who always has access to your internal network and all of your critical assets? Who's probably taken the liberty of adding themselves to the local admin group, giving them elevated permissions? And who usually doesn't understand security or networks quite as well as all your administrators do? That's right, the user. So let's talk about the user's desktop. It's usually less protected. It's not on the high priority list for your admins. Um, but it's also much more complex in most cases. It's actually usually from some standard build that meets the requirements of your entire business, your entire organization. So you're going to have lots of different apps on all the same apps on all of your different uh, desktops. Um, and because they're so much more complex, they become much more difficult to patch. You have lots of third-party apps, which equals a lot more client-side attack vectors. <clears throat> so again, why are they so vulnerable? Well, third-party applications, in-house developed tools, lots of things that WSUS or SUS doesn't actually patch. Um, some organizations that have a very good handle on their baseline and the number of third-party tools may have some third-party app that helps patch those things, but most people don't have that good handle on it. And usually your workstations aren't a priority. Um, your, your network admins, your server admins, you know, they want to make sure that server's up to date first. So this isn't so bad, right? Someone's browser. <clears throat> a lot of people may look at this and say, wow, look at all that crap. It's a lot of junk on there. Well, anybody that's doing client-side attacks may look down here at the bottom and see all these applications that are installed and running. And those all equal attack vectors, all third-party attacks. <clears throat> so why would we target users and the user's access versus, say, system if you exploit some service? Well, you, the users have legitimate access to your critical assets. It's the most important thing. As a domain user, you can generally get more information out of your network versus system. You can use all your net commands and all your DS query commands and get further information that you can use to further target, say, your domain administrators or your enterprise administrators with an additional fish. And then the big thing, <clears throat> since we do so good at protecting things coming in and monitoring things coming into your network, uh, all this traffic, all the malicious pieces of this traffic are coming out of your network from the user's desktop out. So egress filtering generally isn't so good. So in a typical pen test, here's our steps. Find these in the back of any hacking magazine, mag, uh, any book, Hacking Exposed. And the things in red are those that we share in similarity with the client side attack. <clears throat> this is our general, typical pen test. Uh, it's oversimplified, of course. You get your attacker, you get your target. We got a firewall in place. We go across the network, do our scannings, and attempt some attacks, and they all fail. Got some firewall in place, just dropping everything. Um, typical pen test is not really testing all of your users and doing client side at this point. It's going to say, hey, you're secure. Here's your rubber stamp, and pay me. That's not very good, especially in this economy. <clears throat> So what we propose in this client-side pen test methodology is we do a lot more upfront, a lot more reconnaissance, a lot more information gathering. Uh, we use open source tools like Multigo to grab as much information as possible about your organization so that we can generate a very targeted attack against the right people. Uh, we decide on that attack vector, whether it's an email or standing up a mil malicious website, send our attack and wait for someone to open the email. Uh, once they do, we secure access and switch to an internal pen test and start trying to move laterally. Um, and at that point, we should be okay because the inside of your network is safe and secured and monitored, right? right? Very well monitored most of the time. So here's another diagram, again, a, a little oversimplified, but we have our attacker and our target. Same firewall, and we want to make sure that all those same things in, during a typical pen test are also tested for. We do want to make sure that your servers are securely patched, your firewall is doing its job, your ACLs are in place. But once that's done, we look to your weak link, the user. Stand up our malicious website, send an email. Email, of course, gets open because it looks uh, nice and juicy. It's something that was targeted, and they pull down the malware from our server, and here's a nice 
Internet Explorer vulnerability that maybe we pushed via Word document. At that point, we get a reverse shell coming out over 80 using passive X, and we have access to your network from the inside out. Okay, so um, common uh, scenarios we can run into while we're doing this. Um, we want to target specific employees or groups. Um, do, ha have you determined during the scoping calls what makes your business money and who controls that? Let me try to send those guys an email and then let me, do I want to give them a malicious attachment or do I want to send them to a malicious website? Uh, social engineering, do I just get the user to install my malware? Hey, you need a codec, you need to download whatever. Here's a new current AV update. Uh, I need you to install it for me. Uh, I can fish for usernames and passwords. Uh, those are fairly common. Or if you want to get, when, when these are escalating, large scale client side infections. Do I have right access to the back end of your database? Can I insert code into every site on your public website or your internal wiki or whatever? Um, and then scopes within that. Maybe I just want to track metrics. So if, if the client's not too keen on you running code or throwing things on the boxes, let me just gather metrics and see how many people actually clicked my link and then how many people actually entered in data on my fish site. Uh, maybe I want usernames and passwords and that's all I want. Or I can ex exploit client side vulnerabilities or install, run malware, run my Trojan, uh, either through social engineering or if you've got some crafty Java or some other tools, you can try to do that as well. So here's our entry points. Uh, all those should be fairly common to most of the people in the room, right? So all our office, Adobe stuff, yay for Adobe the past couple weeks. Um, browsers, ActiveX, you name it. Uh, and then we get into social engineering and then physical. Obviously that one's kind of starred because that's an on, I need to be on site. Uh, but hey, uh, USB drops, CD drops, how many people are gonna stick that USB key that I left in the bathroom into the computer to see who it belonged to or what was on it before they take it home? Um, granted, Microsoft just pushed out the auto run, but I'm going to maybe check on, uh, sorry, got random pop-ups here. Yay, Windows. Uh, so, uh, so who's going to, you know, physical attack is a way if you're doing an on-site. And I think like uh, HD and Val had talked about a couple years ago, if, if I'm getting paid a lot of money to do a pen test and we're targeting uh, people, that's not too much money to expend, especially if I'm a bad guy and I'm trying to get after what makes you money. I'm going to spend a couple hundred dollars for USB keys from Costco. So our delivery methods, uh, basically we have email. So open my attachment. I'm going to send you some sort of malicious attachment. Or follow my link, which is going to lead, lead us into a web attack method. Web attack methods go from phishing sites, browser exploits, uh, vulnerable third-party controls, uh, I can cross-site script a user to uh, a vulnerable page or something that's maybe Metasploit uh, serving up um, any of the other uh, exploits above that. SMB relay attacks, if you're internal, kind of fixed, but not really. Uh, they've recently added some things in Metasploit. We set an SMB host, but actually will relay those credentials to a, to a second uh, server. Uh, if I have right access to the web server application, I can just inject code or download run my executable uh, via social engineering or no exploit required Java. That was kind of the new hotness in 08. We're kind of, we'll have to look for something good for 09, but, uh, and we'll talk about that no exploit required one. Um, and instant messaging. Bottom line, I need the user to interact with one of my payloads. I need them to run my executable, scan my executable with AV, visit my site, or open my attachment. Fairly common. Is everybody kind of in agreement with that? Does need someone to interact? At least you're interacting, thank you. All right, so some examples. Open my attachment. Uh, office attachments are great. Why are they so great? Do you block office attachments at your gateway? Does anybody block docs? Okay, one guy. Generally not because you need those for business. People are exchanging, you don't, but most people need those for business. Or PDFs. PDFs used to be the old safe thing to send instead of Word documents, right? When, it was all, the, when all the viruses were attaching themselves to office things. Uh, they're difficult to detect. Um, can your AV scan and analyze the code that a macro is going to run if you enable it? I don't know of any that do that. So if I have some malicious macro code, maybe if I use the stuff for Metasploit, it can find Metasploit in there. But if I've written my own custom tools, like maybe I build my binary and run it on the box, uh, AV is not going to detect that. So thanks to, thanks to Metasploit, uh, 
Macro creation is now super easy, which kind of sucks because that was really the old reliable. Uh, we'll, go, we'll, we'll drive on through that. So a personal example from one of our pen tests, it was like, hey, free flu shots available. It's flu season time. Everybody wanted their flu shot. All I need you to do is open my uh, spreadsheet and you get all the information about where to get your free flu shot. Would any of your users on your network probably open that at flu season? Right, it's all I need. Again, so I get them to open that and I get my, I get my user access out. Uh, to show that I'm not making it up, back at the Olympics time, uh, there was a, an uh, Olympics fish going around, had a malicious uh, P Adobe PDF attachment with embedded JavaScript. It's kind of what it looked like. Um, I don't know, pretty good fish. It's, you know, pretty, got lots of text to read. Uh, inside of that, oops, well, inside of that was uh, malicious uh, JavaScript to try to download an executable. Uh, and similar was a zip file, but it had uh, an office, at, an access attachment that tried to take advantage of the jet engine overflow. So again, can I create a good fish to get a user to interact with my uh, malicious content? So in this case, most people are dropping zips, but you probably just could have sent the whole access file by itself and it would have got through. Um, LinkedIn had a similar thing in 08. Hey, hey you need to check out my, uh, my new update to the list. The list had a, uh, had a Trojan and was just trying to steal usernames, passwords, and sensitive data. Uh, same thing. My, now Microsoft's getting into the into the group, or into the groove. And hey, I'll just send you the attack, send you the update by email. This is so much easier for you. But hey, just to show that it's really from me, I'm going to go ahead and PGP sign it. Well, it's really just text at the bottom of the email. But some users may have heard of this PGP thing, so it's signed, right? So it's trustworthy. Again, you guys seen any of these before? Or? Yeah. So we're going to do some demos. Uh, I did not uh, attempt the demo guides. I recorded mine. Sorry. Um, basically, we're going to use Metasploit because um, I kind of have to, but not really. Um, all the four pay frameworks are actually really great at doing this. We just don't have a copy. So if you want to give me one and have me show you how to do, how to do it with yours, talk to me after. Uh, so the first one is the Office uh, with the uh, VB code. Uh, really, it's the no exploit required way. Uh, all I need is the ability to run macros or the ability to downgrade my security settings and run macros. And we're going to cross our fingers. All right, cool. It's working. I hope. It's blanking. All right, cool. We're, we're running. So basically, this is almost in real time. We just used MSF payload to create our VB uh, exploit code. It takes a couple of seconds to generate. We want to make sure that it's there. All right, so it's there. Uh, the first one of these is a little slow. We kind of speed up the whole Metasploit stuff for the other demos. Um, again, so we've outputted it to a text file. <clears throat> Give us an email, something worth opening. Yeah, I need something there after the user enables macros. Uh, import our code. Make sure it's there. Save it. All right. What we're going to do here is we're going to just set up the uh, multi-handler to actually catch uh, all the callbacks. So um, tell it what payload we're expecting. So we love Interpreter. So we're going to uh, have it expect an Interpreter reverse shell. So again, egressing out of the network to us. Um, in real life, we're going to use something probably different than 8899, like 443. That's something that's allowable out of the firewall. But it's a demo. Sure, I'll run it. Why not? It's about all it takes. Um, at the end of this, at the end of presentation, we'll talk a little bit of how to protect from that. So, how do you guys think th is the way to protect from that? Anybody want to throw a guess on how how I would protect against that? Strong group policy, right? I don't allow the user to enable that macro. Um, if you need, if you're in a position where you need to have them enable macros, then we could set the, put them in their own OU. So all we're showing here is that the connection was, uh, was established. We're actually going to go in here and actually close the Word document and show that even after they close the Word document, we still have our, uh, our shell. 
That's basically what Metasploit made there. If you look in the VB script, you see that was the server or the executable, random executable it makes when it does that. So we've, we've closed it and we're just showing again. Is it still there? We've still got our connection outbound. Uh, it's still running. So even though the user has closed the Word document, we're still good to go. All right, so that was a, when I made that, that was a current uh, XP Service Pack 3 image. All right, so uh, anybody heard of the file format exploits in Metasploit? A couple, couple of guys in the back. Um, basically what the file format exploits allow you to do is encapsulate what used to be served up when you hit the web, the web browser for Metasploit and actually encapsulate that in the vulnerable um, application. So if it's a PDF, I can make a PDF. If it's, uh, if it's a uh, web payload, I can actually make a .html with that payload. So what the, what the importance of that is if you've got a control that's not marked safe for scripting, so say if someone browsed to me on the, inter on the internet with that, it, you may get enough prompts or your active, uh, your internet explorer settings may be enough to not allow you to run that where if I can get you to open that file locally, it's gonna take advantage of a different set of permissions. Uh, so another demo is uh, just to show that it's not always a, uh, we don't always pick on Microsoft. Uh, there was a bug with Opera 9.62, uh, heap overflow, uh, had pretty a wide range of coverage. Uh, it kind of demonstrates what happens as you're missing those third party patches. So if you're allowing your users, well, man, Internet Explorer is evil, I don't wanna use it. I'm gonna go ahead and install Opera, it's gonna keep me safe. And most of these exploits are uh, in the trunk now, if you guys are following that. <clears throat> so again, we just set our output file name to HTML isn't evil, set up our uh, reverse shell back when the ports. Uh, it basically outputs the file into one of your, in your home directory, not your home directory, but in a Metasploit directory. So basically then you attach that to your email and send it off to um, the people you've gathered via open source. So get it, get it into their inbox, get it into their desktop. Again, that was it. That's about all it took. Do any of you guys see that as a, a, a much better attack vector that I can actually send you an email uh, versus having you hit that link or or coerce you otherwise. Um, some organizations are obviously more inclined to open an attachment versus uh, actually browse out. So basically all we're showing there is, hey, that's still running, that just exploited the Opera. Again, PDFs, sorry I don't have the new one. I'm not cool enough yet to have, have the code. I'm not on the immunity uh, early release stuff. Again, really wide range of coverage for uh, this Adobe vulnerability. So if you've got, if you're in an organization maybe where um, for some sort of business case, you can't upgrade to nine. Um, you may be stuck with some old versions of Adobe. Um, so let's demonstrate that, hey, what happens when I'm missing patches on a regularly allowable third-party application? It's just a demo kind of that just info, just showing what's, what's vulnerable. Again, we're just going to set set our file name. You know, it's going to be flushotinfo.pdf or whatever. Again, just set up the multi handler to catch all the callbacks. You can actually set that to false if you want to have it keep sending a whole bunch back to you. So if you send that out to 100 people, you don't want to stop on the first one. But again, um, open the PDF. Now, everyone in this room would obviously get a little suspicious when we get to the uh, blank PDF opening. But you know, as I'm kind of checking out forums as we were doing some of this, um, you'd be surprised at the amount of people that were really not that concerned that they were having blank PDFs opened. Um, there was some, it was pretty recently, they were delivering uh, malicious PDFs via advertisements. I don't know if anybody saw some of that going on. I know Val did. Um, 
tons of forums like, yeah, I kept getting this PDF open, it was blank, and I don't know what was up with that. Uh, you're owned, that was, that was up, that's what was up with that. All right, last demo. Um, basically, um, we're gonna show ActiveX control. Um, the problem with ActiveX control bugs is if they don't have the control installed, I really can't, I don't have, a over, I don't have anything to, to exploit. So what we're gonna show the first try is what happens when I get someone, when I send them the file and they don't have the control installed. And the second time, I'm actually gonna serve up the vulnerable uh, cap file, have them install that and then exploit them. So I'm gonna take someone that wasn't vulnerable and make them vulnerable if they, they have to click one more yes on the ActiveX stuff. So this is just a uh, ActiveX bug in the eTrust uh, antivirus scan. It's kind of like a web uh, AV scanning engine. So HTML, it's our output file. Same thing, reverse meta-interpreter because we love meta-interpreter. And we're actually, po we, all these are posted and they run at like regular speed, so if something's moving too fast for you, which is probably not, but. So basically all we're gonna show is here, hey, I got him to, I got him to open it. Sure, I'll enable that ActiveX control. Why not? Do you guys have any users that would click on that? I, oh, I'm sure everybody does, so. Basically all what happened is it crashed because they didn't have the control installed. Uh. So what we're gonna do here is, that's showing the vulnerable ID. That's actually the URL that's still serving up the vulnerable control today. Um, that's kind of a bummer. And that's the vulnerable control right there. These aren't too hard to find. Plenty of people um, you know, archive these for you for development and sometimes the sites will serve them up. All right, so cab install this time, same thing. <coughs> This actually really isn't a new technique. I found a post from 2001 that talked about doing this, uh, but it still works. So this time we got them to install the cab install one. I think we're gonna get one more ActiveX prompt to actually install it. It looks like all the others. And it's not too hard to get these people to do that. Just tell them in the fish to expect to have to enable that ActiveX control. That's all you gotta do. Just tell them to expect it. So that was, that was it, they installed it, and in the background, we'll get our shell. It's that simple. So basically we took someone that wasn't vulnerable and made them vulnerable. Any value in that for any of the guys that do testing? Maybe. Maybe important to realize that it can happen. All right, so uh, follow my links. We've seen that a million times again. Uh, the important thing for those is they typically bypass your perimeter security. Most people allow 8443 out. People need to browse the web to do work. And so things to ask yourself when you're allowing that, which everyone does, is do you have URL filters? Are you using an outbound proxy? Does everyone in your enterprise have to go through a proxy to browse the web? Um, if you're making your 443, your, your outbound, pro outbound IP, uh, port, um, you know, Metasploit or most Trojans aren't gonna be smart enough to know that it has to go through a proxy to get out. So you're gonna see that user's box trying to go out over 443. That's a big flag that something's going on. Do you have a content inspection proxy? Is it really HTTP traffic? Is it really HTTPS traffic? And then payloads from the web can be difficult to detect. So example from um, some pen tests, uh, sim simple password sync. Does anybody have password syncs for their organizations where uh, prob I've been in places, my first email I got was, hey, you need to give us all this information so if you forget your password, you can do it without the help desk support. Um, so why couldn't an organization actually uh, roll that out as a great feature for its users? So that's what we get. Hey, you, uh, go ahead and log on, and then once you log in, we'll, we'll uh, go ahead and um, get all this password information so you don't have to bother anybody later. We log the results, we write some custom PHP to actually catch that stuff. So we catch the usernames, we catch the passwords, 
Uh, and some of the browsers, like Firefox, will actually tell you some of the plugins that are installed. So we can now further do directed client-side attacks if I can see something in that plugin area that is actually vulnerable to something. In the news, just a common fish. You guys see these every day. Uh, some of them are getting pretty good. I actually got a PayPal one that had my name in it. I don't know how they got it, but generally that's your key that it's fake, but it had my name in it. So it doesn't always have to be about metrics or about a shell. We can just gather metrics. A uh, good way to do that is Google Analytics. I, get, I make two of those, uh, one for the first page of the fish and one for the second page. So after they hit the enter button, whether or not I'm actually logging those results, and that depends on scope and what the client wants, if they just want to know how many people entered in data but not, but not actually logged that data, then I just put a second set on the second page. So if they entered in data and hit enter, then they put something in. So I can say I sent the email to 200 people, 100 people actually went to the website, and 15 actually made it to the second page. So I'm, I have some good metrics to give back in the report. So web examples, uh, browser exploits, um, all common stuff. We got, we've seen all those. Those are pretty high profile ones with the MS0902 out right now. <clears> hey, <throat> okay, thanks for clicking that. It's kind of common. I didn't do any demos of these. These are actually pretty well known. I figured no one would need to see me doing uh, a browser exploit. Uh, same thing, third party vulnerabilities that have things that interact in the browser. So. Uh, any of your real players, quick times, as Dino did, uh, any of the AV things that scan. A lot of your AV clients will actually install ActiveX controls when they install stuff. So .mov. Do you really worry about .mov files? Do your, are your users concerned that clicking on .movs would be bad? I would say most people are not. ActiveX controls. So one from another pen test. Uh, personal example: When the Java web when the Java web start vulnerability was going around, <coughs> we were actually on a pen test for that time, and I used that as a chance to craft a fish uh, to the admins. We'd already gotten access via something else, so we wanted admin access. So I actually uh, sent this just to the admin group. Said, "Hey, there's this thing. You guys manage your own sets of pieces of the network. I need you guys to take a look at this vulnerability and install the patches." And I just copied the whole thing, all the pages from the advisory, and just put them on a on a printer, actually. So what was on that page was the uh, Access Snapshot Viewer. I don't know if you guys saw this when it came out. Basically what it did was it didn't take advantage of any memory corruption. It just said I wanted to download a file to a location of my choosing on the client. So I just put it in the all user startup and I just put our Trojan. So every time they logged in, I had an outbound shell. And that was a reliable, we had about five reliable shells the whole week of the engagement from that. Um, and it was. It was beautiful because the ActiveX control they were trying to run was a, a Microsoft ActiveX control. So chances are it's not evil bad guys ActiveX control. It was just Microsoft. So most people would probably allow that. Uh, Cross-site scripting attacks. <clears throat> if I can find cross-site scripting attacks in your company's website, so maybe I checked out uh, crosssitexss.com before I started the engagement. Maybe you've already got a public cross-site scripting vulnerability you haven't fixed. I can take that to exploit the user's trust to redirect them to one of my web payloads. Um, if you're internal, not necessarily internal, but um, you can try a cross-site scripting shell, uh, limited functionality in my opinion, or if you're internal, maybe you can try an X, uh, SMB relay attack. Again, that's kind of fixed. How about uh, if I have write access, uh, Val Smith actually talked about this at Black Hat. Uh, some guys, if, if you can actually write malicious code into the backend database so it's displayed on every page that the user visits uh, and just do mass iframe attacks. Again, maybe I want to do this on an internal site. So every internal person, uh, it's not really necessarily a, a remote attack, it's more of an internal attack. But if I can get uh, malicious code to display every time someone uh, views a site, then maybe I can deliver a web payload to them, to them that way. And that's just a real world one where those guys got their back end database uh, hacked and malicious iframes are being served up. Again, we've all seen this one. Uh, hey, I need to in, you need to install this codec. Uh, there's actually a Facebook one going around so you can get Flash 11, I think it is. It's not out yet, but if you're a Facebook user, you need it. Or Antivirus 2009. Uh, man, I hate those guys. So uh, this one's actually, most of this came from a guy I co blog with, Dean DeBeer. Uh, this actually made the top 10 for uh, Jeremiah's list, the ActiveX repurposing. 
Um, basically, it was a Microsoft ActiveX control that would allow you to give it an executable from a URL, download to that of a name of your choosing, and then execute it. So that's basically what's happened in the red. There's a whole lot of actual code that makes that happen, but that's the important thing. Download the executable, and then I was able to run that. On IE6, for service, this fixed with Service Pack 3, they kill bitted the actual control, but for Service Pack 2, on IE6, it would just run without a prompt because it was trusted. IE7, you'd get the typical, uh, you need to enable my ActiveX control uh, pr prompts, but it would still run. So that was, that was the fun stuff for 08. That worked every time. Uh, so malicious. Aside from the .cn address, would someone consider maybe a blank page malicious or a 404 server error or just a under construction? We don't always think that those pages are malicious. So behind the scenes, this is iframe. Everybody's probably seen this a million times, but um, hey, we're serving up Flash exploits, Office exploits, uh, our game, GLED down two exploits and real player stuff. Pretty nasty stuff if I'm allowing Java to run in my browser. So how do I take advantage of that as a pen tester? That's a great attack vector. It's obviously working. It's so prevalent right now. It works, or the bad guys wouldn't be doing it. So how can I use that? Thanks to Browser Autopone, we can use that. So if, if you, um, it, Browser Autopone actually does some smart Java to kind of determine uh, user agents and versions and serve up exploits based on that. And you can actually edit this to be your own iframe attack. You just put what you want. So if you just want the MSO902 stuff, if you're pretty sure the organization has a good patching policy, you're not going to get an exploit from uh, 2006 to work. So there's really no reason to try to serve that up. AV is going to flag on that. You're going to get a bunch of things. So if I have something custom or if I have something new, maybe I can just put two or three exploits. Same thing. I send that URL out. Now they come to think they get a much more targeted attack or just a few things. Uh, so that's really powerful and something everybody should be checking out if they haven't. All right, back to Vince. All right, so all is not lost. Uh, we talked about a lot of things, uh, and it seems pretty gloomy. Um, but there are ways that we can try to mitigate this from happening, or lessen the impact at least. Uh, strong desktop, desktop baselines. So when we roll out those baselines, make sure that users can't add themselves to the admin group. Make sure that there's not a million third-party apps that you have no way to patch. Um, Spam filters, you know, if that content never gets to the user's inbox, then the user's never going to have the opportunity to make the mistake and get your network compromised. Uh, outbound content filtering and egress filtering. Uh, we don't want to allow every port coming out of your network. And in addition, whatever ports we are allowing coming out, we want to make sure that proper protocols are actually being used on those ports. So if we have something in the clear going over 443, that might look a little weird. Might want to look into it. Something. Not HTTP going out at over 80. Why is that? <clears throat> uh, on the host, um, you know, IPSs. Let's not allow things that weren't resonant or part of your policy to actually execute. Managed AV. We've been a lot of places where the AV is up to the user. So we, we find all different versions of the DAT files. Um, strong group policy. We talked about macros. Macros have been old faithful. So a lot, of, uh, a lot of places that we've tested, the settings are set to high, which means the users, or I'm sorry, the macros themselves don't execute automatically. But the GPO allows the users to lessen that down to a medium security policy, which then allows the macro to be executed. And that has worked, uh, I want to say, 100% of the time. Um, host integrity monitoring, again, if it wasn't there to start with, it shouldn't be there now. Uh, and user a scareness training. So, it's easy to sit through once a, once a year, slip through, sit through uh, a PowerPoint presentation that says, don't click on links, don't go to these bad sites. And at the end of it, someone just says, yep, I, I got my training for the year. But it's important to really scare your users, let them know what the real threats are, how they alone, by opening their email or browsing to some site, can totally compromise the security of your network and give up all those critical assets that they're trying to protect. The important one of that is uh, your, your client-side test can be your awareness training. When you send that phish email out to the enterprise or to 300, 500 people, how many people called the help desk and said they got a weird email? Right? Encourage your users to do that. It's probably hell on the help desk or your security if you got a SOC, if they're getting all those emails. But 
are the users actually saying, man, this is kind of weird. Can you look into this for me? Because that's real world training. And that's what they need to be on the lookout for and encourage them to, to, to report that. So uh, inspiration, uh, Lenny Zelter's done some, a lot of great work with using client sides or how to test for those. Uh, core impact guys, uh, attack research, and then uh, there's some stuff on SANS there that the guy came out with a really good white paper on how to use targeted social engineering. And that's it. All the demos are on the Vimeo channel now if you want to check them out, uh, if you didn't see something or want to see it again. Uh, and with that, I'll open it up to any questions if anybody has any. Yes. And the second question I had was, do you usually have to sell the um, team you're working with during engagement on the idea of doing client side attacks, and how hard is that to sell them on? Most definitely have to sell it, and that's kind of what this is, is an awareness thing to say, hey, you need to, it's happening, so you need to test for it. Um, it's Replicate the threat. Replicate the threat, and it is, don't get me wrong, it's not an easy sell. Anybody here that does pen testing will tell you it's extremely hard to get someone to buy off on that. Um, the best thing is you can try to slip it into the scope, um, force it upon them, or ideally you have clients that are, under, are security aware enough, they're past the test my remote or just give me enough of a pen test to pass my PCI certification. Um, people that are actually really interested in protecting what makes them money. If I can get you to identify what makes you money and then start having you think about what you're doing to protect it, then that's a natural thing to say, well, Client sides are what's how people are getting in. If someone does that, am I protecting my critical data that way? Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's been that's kind of been the hardest thing we've come across. Uh, so we've we've written our tools to match protocols. Uh, if you have something that's actually looking at content, we've written tools to try to set timing to look like real protocols. Um, but things that are actually using proxies, we're, we're, we're still working on that problem. That's a very good <coughs> defense mechanism. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Making sure that it's, hmm? A lot of people. No. I, I don't think so. I, I mean, that's kind of open for everyone else. Yeah. You know, how many people are running blue coats or something similar? Let's put it this way. We've run into places <coughs> where uh, if we tried to come out over, say, 443 without using SSL, everything got dropped and we were unsuccessful. As soon as we switched it to SSL, it worked. So we, we've been successful 100% of the time, so we've never run into a combination of both those things. So uh, in your presentation, uh, testing users and testing for client side vulnerabilities seem to be uh, equated. Like those two things are uh, together. However, it may be an easier sell uh, to just claim that you're testing vulnerabilities in client-side applications. You don't necessarily have to fish the user uh, in order to uh, lure them to click on something. You just can send them an official email saying, I need to test your client's application to figure out if they're vulnerable or not. Sure. Um, sure. I mean, you could get one of your <coughs> trusted insiders or whatever to click on that link for you and start working you know, working from there. So, so my question is, is there any other way to test for client applications to figure out if they are patched or not? Um, yeah, well, I guess someone could give you a build. If Give me a laptop with your standard build, and then you kind of takes the fun out of it, but you could do it that way. You could then deliver a pretty detailed report of what you found. And really, in, in that circumstance, you get to test what that baseline is and to see if those client vulnerabilities exist or not. But if you're trying to test to see if an attacker can get access to your network or your organization's critical information that may not be on that particular baseline, but that's only your entry point, then you're really not testing the entire organization as a whole. Sure, uh, not us. How do you, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, <clears throat> you'll ha typically have some sort of trusted agent inside of that, someone that knows what you're doing. Uh, obviously, you want to keep that limited. It's the same thing of running into, I don't want everyone to patch everything before I show up cause for the pen test because we're not giving you an, an accurate representation of how you're managing your network. But having somebody in there that can stop the, uh, the five alarm fire from going off when that goes off, you know, they may, may be expecting the email. I mean, depending on how, how much control the customer wants, you could even tell them what the email is going to look like and what it's going to be trying to exploit. So that way you have a guy managing, if you're testing your, maybe your, your, your SOC's response times and what they're doing, that guy can watch and see how your internal team is responding to that threat and kind of keep that from, you know, getting too elevated. Uh, really just arch articulating that to the customer, what they're expecting. Anything else? Current events, I mean, current events, it, most users are similar. Um, like I said, the office thing almost always works if we can get the email to actually hit people's inboxes. Um, don't have a lot of like hard numbers for you that this type of organization was more susceptible to this or that. Um, it's very, it's, right. Um, Right. Sure. I see what you're asking. I don't. I don't have any numbers for you. Anybody else? Um. As an attack vector. Uh, I didn't specifically mention that. We mentioned like that's one of your entry points or one of your, it was definitely one of the top 10 is like all the random widgets and things. Um, but you could definitely use that as part of your, uh, basically part of your open source intelligence gathering process, you're definitely going to use those tools and that could definitely be a way. Uh, how about I just send uh, your guys LinkedIn messages with my payload versus sending it to your, um, your corporate inbox. info gathering uh, the, the problem you could run into that is now I'm getting maybe getting the user to open it at home and now I'm getting something off his cable modem which is probably not in scope depends if it's if it's sky's the limit then yeah it is but most we're, we're really looking to see how your how the organization and the enterprise is protecting things and not so much him at, at home uh, on off his cable modem yeah I mean we don't want to go to I don't want to go to jail, and I want to make sure it's, I don't want to say it's fair, but I want to make sure that we're t uh, testing what the customer wants us to, to take a look at. Can't you use your system to be used to, if you have a VPN connection established? Sure. Uh, that's definitely possible because uh, uh, technically you're on the LAN at that point. And, and uh, we wouldn't, if, if that were to happen uh, to us, it would look like we were on the LAN. We'd have a list of what was, hopefully we'd have, maybe we would have a list of uh, internal ranges to make sure that we're okay to sh come back from those. Hey, if he's on the if he's on a NATed 10.10 network, then yep, you're good. Uh, so we can continue to go on, and and he would have the access that we were looking for. As far as we would know, remotely, he was on them. He was at work. Anything else? All right. Thanks everyone for your time. <laughs>